Coming up on Market to Market. Small meat processors look to stretch their business across state lines. An old crop gets new life in a crowded market. And market analysis with Naomi Bloom next. So therefore the market said. What's the most complex industry on earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, June 12 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The Federal Reserve said they know when to hold them when it comes to interest rates. This week, the FOMC took any nuance out of the possibility of raising rates, adding they may stay the course until at least 2022. Consumer prices are down for the third straight month on lower airline fares and hotel bills. The sales for recreation items are brisk. Good luck finding that trampoline or home pool at traditional prices, if at all. The producer price index rebounded in May four-tenths of a percent as the price of meat surged in the measure of wholesale prices. The pandemic has altered consumer habits as shoppers look for locally sourced items not processed in a large-scale plant. Butcher shop business has been brisk with customers looking to fill freezers with items found in their community. Those same meat markets also see demand coming from farther away and in some cases are not able to fill the orders. As Peter Tubbs shows us, local shops see opportunities over state lines. The USDA program that allows small state inspected meat processors to sell product across state lines has added another name to its lineup. The Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program, administered by the USDA and seven participating states, grants approval to smaller meat processors, allowing them to change their business models from a local focus to one that touches all 50 states. 66 companies in six states currently have approval to ship nationally and Iowa became number seven when it reached a deal with the USDA in May. So if we uh, provide that service, they're restricted to be able to only be able to resell that product within the state of Iowa. This allows them to enter into larger distribution networks, maybe organic grass-fed or pasture-raised pork or some of these especially smaller farm type things and be able to ship those uh, around the country and even around the world. <laughs> There are 68 Iowa processors that meet CIS criteria, and Gustafson is one of 13 processors to apply to the Iowa Department of Agriculture. State and federal slaughter, processing, and inspection rules are similar, with states having more leeway to reach standards equal to those specified in the federal rules. Among those differences are labeling, which must match USDA guidelines. The CIS was part of the 2008 Farm Bill, and allows for slaughterhouses or meat processors with an average of fewer than 25 employees to receive approval for sales nationally. Ohio was the first state to receive approval in 2012 and has the largest number of CIS processors at 25. The primary beneficiaries of the program are processors that reside close to state borders, companies that want to expand their markets, and processors that wish to sell online. It's really uh, a great thing for small processors. Um, it's gonna allow uh, us to provide more services and to even um, distribute specialty products even farther. And a lot of the small processors are in small rural communities, which provides more jobs and more opportunities than in those communities. Vendors are hopeful they can receive final approval this summer. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Hemp has become a crop of choice for producers looking to try something different. Cannabis sativa L applies to both marijuana 
and hemp plants, but the one being put into fields all across the U.S. has less than three-tenths of a percent of THC, the psychoactive component that gives you that high feeling. Hemp is under that level, and only a lab test can confirm the difference. Josh Bittner looks at the return of the plant to the land of the tall corn. Yeah. Yeah, I spend every day out here looking and checking, so. Colby Gardner worked in the financial industry before a burgeoning new field drew him back to the Iowa farm life he grew up around. He had been watching developments since the first pilot programs began in 2014. And when the 2018 Farm Bill finally legalized hemp production for the first time in nearly 80 years, Gardner rolled the dice with plans to plant seeds on a former cattle lot in Warren County. Success for me this year is getting to the end and getting a, uh, a certificate from the state that says I can sell what I've done. And then I'll let, we're, let the market dictate what I get from there. Gardner has one of the more than 70 grow licenses that have been granted for the Hawkeye State's 2020 inaugural planting run. But unlike other crops, hemp applicants must pass a criminal background check void of any controlled substance convictions within the prior decade. Iowa Department of Agriculture Hemp Administrator Robin Prusner was tasked with weaving state and federal regulations into a coherent program for producers to navigate. The first thing I tell people they need to do is determine what hemp product they're actually growing. Um, when we do our traditional corn and soybean crops in the state of Iowa, you grow the corn and you can sell it to a multitude of different buyers and processes and end products. Hemp is exactly opposite. You have to first figure out what it is that you're growing, and then that is going to drive all of those decisions. Hemp can be used to make anything from food to clothing to plastic, even ethanol. But the largest market currently by far is cannabidiol, or CBD, an oil extracted for its various health benefits. Prusner says growers can hold multiple permits, but when tallied together, state law caps the total number of acres at 40. I commend Iowa for doing that, and I think that obviously, you know, makes people uh, really uh, not want to jump the gun as much having something like that in place. Kentucky Hemp Industries Association President Tate Hall says farmers in his state are allowed to grow hundreds of acres of hemp. The initiative, begun in 2014, was partially undertaken to help ailing tobacco farmers. Kentucky and other states like Colorado and Illinois have a head start on Iowa, where the state legislature, fresh off a COVID-19 recess, just passed a bill to allow CBD processing within their borders. I think every part of the plant can be utilized for something, um, you know, being for the textile industry, the grain industry, um, cannabinoids. So there's a lot of different facets that people can go off of. Industry proponents say the biggest obstacle to a full-fledged American hemp revolution is infrastructure. While that gets built out, Colby Gardner plans to haul his first harvest to existing processors in Wisconsin. Hey, look, with this whole project, you work with what you got. If you get over leveraged, that's how you see a lot of companies fail. This season, Gardner will only grow female plants, which are required for CBD. However, his production method comes with a stumbling block rooted in Iowa's past. You need to worry about drift. I mean, there's remnants of a, a World War II crop that's all around here, and people kind of realize that, and it could strongly affect what I'm, what I'm doing here. It could diminish the value of our, our plants greatly. Hemp prohibition was briefly loosened in order to make ropes for the U.S. Navy's efforts to combat the Axis powers. According to Iowa Hemp Association President Dr. Christopher Disbro, Iowa grew upwards of 40,000 acres of the plant decades ago. The side effect being feral hemp, or ditchweed, persists to this day in states like Iowa and Nebraska. They yield the most fiber and the best. The reality is that that's government genetics that have basically been left on their own um, to develop climate tolerances, and it's you know had 80 years to pretty much go by itself in our ditches. This is uh, ditch wheat. This is what it looks like once it's been dried. Disbro was on hand when Governor Kim Reynolds signed the Iowa Hemp Act into law in 2019. He says while Iowa's cautious approach to hemp production has left the state lagging behind some of their neighbors, there is a silver lining. We don't have to reinvent a lot of these things. We can rely on our neighbors for support in a lot of ways in terms of having outlets to reach out, not just for sales ends, but 
to take some of that expertise, uh, even when it comes to genetics. Uh, a lot of varieties will grow very differently in, say, Oregon than they will in Kentucky. And so having some other Midwest information, some Midwest expertise has been valuable there too. It's a lot better than it was because there was probably like 500 plants over here. Gardner diligently patrols a two mile radius around his farm to eradicate potential cross pollination, which can be a daunting task in one of the nation's top wind producing states. If I see it, I assume it's male and it's gone. If I see it and I didn't plant it, it's gone. Gardner has focused his year one efforts on cutting costs by modifying existing equipment and methods to work for his operation. Eventually, he'd like to expand, become more self-reliant, and share what he's learned with other Iowans looking to enter what some forecast as a potential multi-billion dollar industry. I can tell you right now, you have to have a good sense of humor to be out here because sometimes things just don't go according to plan. Nice little bouquet here, right? For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Positioning ahead of a government report and weather had the most influence on the commodity markets. For the week, July wheat lost 13 cents, while the nearby corn contract declined a penny. USDA provided the soy complex with some bullish numbers, but other good news for the oil seed was harder to come by. The July soybean contract gained four cents. July soybean meal fell a dime per ton. July cotton dropped a dollar ninety-five per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, June class three milk futures improved sixty-two cents. Another down week in the livestock sector. August cattle dropped eighty-five cents. August feeders fell three oh eight, and the July lean hog contract decreased two twenty-five. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index added 40 ticks. July crude sold off 310 per barrel. Comex gold jumped 50 to 60 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index shed more than 12 points to finish at 312.10. Joining us now to give us some insight is market analyst Naomi Bloom. Naomi, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. All right, so... Unfortunately, it's not good to see if I'm looking at the wheat markets this week. Uh, combination of maybe a little bit of weakness with, against corn, if corn's been weak, or is it more of a harvest pressure issue? What's going on? Combination of harvest pressure and the USDA report for the old crop um, wasn't as friendly as what people were hoping. So you hit the nail on the head. We've got wheat harvest going on. And it's going to be interesting to find out where those yields are coming in at, because some people feel that the yield numbers are going to be less than what the USDA is representing. Uh, separately, on the USDA report that we had this week, the new crop number for the all wheat ending stocks was actually favorable, coming in closer to 925 million bushels. It's one of the smallest numbers we've seen for five or six years. But the market couldn't rally on that just because the global world carryout numbers, again, a new record large amount. So we're stuck with this battle of um, plenty of supplies around the world. Things might get interesting here at home. And then balancing that along with even spring wheat prices and what the spring wheat market's going to do is there's a lot of uncertainty as far as what did for sure get planted up in the northern plains. Uh, we'll talk about North Dakota in just a moment when it comes to corn. Uh, you also have uh, the wheat. I was just looking here at my note here. It was Minneapolis that was strong for a little while, but then that kind of tamped down. Did the weaker dollar have a bigger impact on, say, new crop, or was it more of an old crop issue? Um, the weaker dollar was helpful for a while this week because of the export markets, but then with today, the dollar finishing stronger, um, everything was just more of a risk-off environment, and the stock market being down so hard on Thursday of this week really spooked um, investors, I yep. think, as well. All right, you making any sales right now on uh, the deferred crop? Um, not quite yet. Um, just kind of holding out a little bit of um, hope and optimism because of what we're hearing from producers about the potential crop in Kansas and parts of Oklahoma. And then that spring wheat market still has my attention as well. All right. The WASD report uh, on Thursday kind of left the yield and production as is for corn. Market rebounded green for a little while. What's the dance going on with corn right now? Um, it's the same song and dance we've had for a while. The USDA didn't do really too many major changes to the corn market in terms of um, the ending stocks numbers. So for old crop ending stocks, we're still over 2 billion bushels, 2.1. Uh, 
Um, but the new crop is what is really hindering the market for the most part. 3.3 billion bushel carryout is significant. So looking forward, what we really need to see for the corn market is a weather rally. And I think one of the bigger things to keep in mind too is that you know, ethanol demand is slowly starting and improving just because people are getting out and about, but it, we still aren't where we need to be for that number. And my bigger thing is, again, we want to watch the weather market because the funds, as of today, officially are short 297,000 contracts of corn. And what you need to know is that when the funds start exiting those positions, every 100,000 contracts that they buy back, historically, that's good for about a 15 cent price rally. So if they exit those 300,000 contracts, that's looking at close to a 45 cent rally, which actually takes us up to the 200 day moving average on those charts. So there could be some momentum there. And I think the momentum would end up coming from soybeans. When we talk about that, that new crop number is really friendly for the ending stocks. Well, and there's a good follow-up you left there, but I do want to get Glenn's question in because this is a little bit about marketing old new crop, which way you want to do. Glenn in Bar Bryan, Ohio is asking, historically June, Naomi has offered a special or has offering pricing opportunities for most commodities. Considering all of the political, economical, social challenges occurring worldwide, should we protect the upside or the downside in this market? Well, I do think that we will see some sort of a weather rally here in the short term. And, and he hits the nail on the head. The summer high is usually between the middle of June to the first part of July. And that's it. It'll be a three or four week rally. And if you've got to make those cash sales as the market goes higher. And the emphasis will be on making sure that we are really aggressive on making those cash sales on the rally because of the potential for the corn ending stocks to be so big. And, and what if we get some sort of a black swan event and then the market prices fall apart lower? So do make sure that we're plugging away on those cash sales on the rally this summer. Okay, we just showed video of a lot of rain this week, but really it's become the heat. The next 10 days, we're day one of this. What's that gonna do soybean wise? Uh, you talk about North Dakota uh, a lot. I've read in your reports, uh, they finally gotten some of that corn out. I'm sure there's somebody who's gonna tell me, no, Paul, I don't have the crop out yet. But we know that that's impacted some of last year's crop. That's impacting a little bit of beans. Which of them, I know North Dakota doesn't matter as much when it comes to beans uh, in this discussion. Why is the weather so important to that bean market right now? Uh, well, it's important because of how tight the ending stocks are. Um, the ending stocks for the new crop coming in at 395 million bushels. And if we have a yield drop of just two to three bushels per acre from where the USDA is projecting, you that have carry out that goes under 200 million bushels. So that is quite significant. And respectfully, North Dakota actually matters a little more than you might anticipate. Um, as far as acres go, they're the fourth largest state that has planted acres and the USDA pegged them to have 6.6 .6 million acres planted this spring. And as of Monday's crop progress report, they only had, um, they have still have 26% of that crop to plant. And so that comes out to 1.7 million acres of soybeans that are not in the ground yet. So North Dakota does matter. Oh. And I'm very curious to see what uh, this Monday's crop progress report is going to be because if 1.7 million acres don't get planted, with Prevent Plant being quite popular this year in North Dakota, that's a whole new ballgame. Right. So, it doesn't matter. And I, should, and I should clarify, one state doesn't, if you buy the conspiracy theory, one state doesn't seem to impact the market as much, is, is what I'm trying to say. But I know, yes, North Dakota, great land, great people, great everything. Uh, so let's talk soybeans here real fast. Let's finish up. Are we making a sale or are we holding? I mean, we've been rallying a little bit. Do we hold out for a little more right now? And what I'm range? Waiting. Yeah, Sunday night weather forecast for the next week, like you talked about, you know, is it going to be rainy? Is it not going to be rainy? Is the dry weather coming in? If the soybean market can clear the 100-day moving average, which is where the July contract finished today and the November contract, we're right up against a major resistance area. If we can clear this hurdle, it's another 25-cent rally on the futures prices. You're going to have November beans that are at $9 for futures, and then that's the point where we definitely want to start making sales. So Sunday night trade into Monday morning is really important. I'll put out a tweet on Sunday night to show where the markets are trading at. All right. We didn't even say the C word really in any of that discussion either, did we, with China? No. <laughs> All right, let's, no. let's talk about C, cheese. 
Derry, uh, we've been waiting to have you on here, uh, and we know the insight. And a lot of people always, just have Naomi on; she'll tell you. We've been rallying. We got a good question. We got several great questions about dairy. One of them came from Matt in Amherst, Wisconsin. He's asking Naomi why the huge reversal in milk prices over the last few weeks. Yeah, so if you remember back, uh, once the whole COVID crisis hit, we were having supply chain issues with the milk market and milk prices plunged to the mid $10 level, which is horrific. But over the past month and a half, that milk price has gone up to over $20 for the front month contract. Huge rally with the July contract getting close to $20. The deferreds are still uh, in the mid $16 to $17 level. And the difference is cheese because we have um, restaurants opening again. We have people moving about. So the cheese demand is there. The cheese price rallied strong for the spot cheese market to prices we haven't seen in a couple of years. And that led the class three milk futures higher as well. Now, a big word of caution is that we had a topping signal on the June contract chart earlier this week, bearish key reversal. So that's oftentimes an indicator that prices might slide. It was a fast rally. So if we do see the setback, it wouldn't surprise me too much, but we do then coming up this week, um, this next week have a milk production report. And that's what we really wanna keep an eye on because we wanna see, did milk production officially drop during the supply chain issues? Because some of those producers were asked to cut production by 10 to 15%, if not more. So that's what the next piece of the puzzle is for milk. We want okay. to keep an eye and understand where production truly is. We've had a little discrepancy in the live cattle market when it comes to cash and futures. Which one's winning out? Which one should I be paying attention to most? It's still a stalemate as far as what's going on there. You've seen the futures price trade sideways for about three weeks because it's trying to catch its breath and understand where the demand truly is and where the supply truly is. Um, we've got the... the uh, production levels starting to improve. Those packing plants are getting closer to full capacity. But with that choice beef value um, being so high and the, and the box beef values being high, we're starting to see those kind of come back down. But the retail market, when you go to the grocery store, the prices are still so high. Uh, cash markets were closer to like 105 to 108. So they are uh, trading at a price um, premium to where the futures market is at. And this next week is going to be a big telling point to know where the weights really are, where the supply is, and keeping an eye on cash. Uh, we're going to probably see the futures market break out of the range this coming week. And depending on what cash does and what retails are doing, it's either going to be 10 bucks to the upside or 10 bucks to the downside. Mm. So really, it's a very significant trading range. Um, so be on your toes with that marketplace. Uh, there's five reasons why I could go higher, five reasons why I could go lower. So and give me two signals on either side, which would help me decide where we're headed. <laughs> right now it's an equal balance. So we'll see, you got to just watch the market prices and then keep an eye on uh, the technicals too, because okay. that's going to be the selling point. All right, feeder wise, August keeps getting talked about is uh, the weight and the amount that's out there. Is that still the biggest bell cow, terrible pun. Yeah, it is. It is. That is something that the market is talking about. We're starting to talk also about pasture conditions. Things are getting dry out west. That feeder contract has also been trading in a sideways manner on the futures charts into a consolidation point. And the August feeders are, are consolidating between 130 and 135. So just like the fat market, I think that we're going to see a price breakout in the coming week, and a lot of it has the direction based on um, cash markets and where the demand truly lies. All right, the hog market hasn't been much better. Is it being impacted by beef, or is the hog market playing down to its own tune? Yeah, so there's two things going on with the hog market. For the nearby contracts, uh, we're trading uh, the, the notion still that production is slowly getting back up to where it's at, and we probably see prices test nearby support levels. But the deferred contracts are starting to tell a different story, and those charts are turning friendlier. And the bigger thing there to keep in mind is that we actually have, uh, for our exports for this year, it's the best they've ever been, over 1.1 million metric tons. So most of that, of course, going to China, about half. But the other thing that the market's starting to pick up on is the sow slaughter numbers are actually increasing. They're about 10% higher than a year ago. And the market's trying to understand what's coming down the road in the future. And I think that's why you're seeing the deferred contracts starting to respond. Uh, the other thing we're understanding is, you know, there were a lot of hogs that were euthanized during the COVID crisis. And now we're trying to really figure out 
where are our production levels at? There's a hogs and pig report coming up uh, soon, so that should give some insight. But keeping an eye on export demand and watching the weights and keeping an eye on the sow slaughter is really important. I think you mean to say what's not coming down the pipe when it comes to the hogs because of the sow report. All right, Naomi, I appreciate your time. We'll pick you up uh, on Market Plus. We'll talk cotton and the dollar and a lot of great questions. Thanks, Naomi. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, that will wrap up the broadcast portion of this television show we call Market to Market, but there is still more to talk about. I just talked about it. Market Plus, that's where we'll answer more of your great questions that come via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can find it on the web at markettomarket.org. Rainy weather, harvest and crop progress picks make for good Instagram content. Check out our feed as we share some of the best images we've taken and seen. Find us at Market to Market Show. Join us next week when U.S. trade policy goes under the microscope on Capitol Hill. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.